We are living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, Page 11. I'd like to just basically review what we studied in our last lecture together. Basically we noticed that Revelation chapter 17 has four key aspects. Number one, Revelation 17 speaks about a harlot, a harlot woman. Secondly, we find that Revelation 17 has a scarlet colored beast. In the third place we notice that this color, uh, car, scarlet colored beast has ten horns. And in the fourth place we notice that this scarlet colored beast actually wants to slay the saints of the Most High. In other words the saints come into view. Now I'd like to review what we studied last time about this harlot who sits on this scarlet colored beast or sits upon the waters. And this will set the stage for us discussing in more detail the beast itself as well as the ten horns that are found on one of the heads of this beast. Revelation 17 presents a harlot and as we've studied in scripture a harlot represents God's people in apostasy. In other words it represents in the Old Testament apostate Israel and in this particular case the apostate Christian church. We notice that one of the reasons or the primary reason for this apostasy is that this harlot fornicates with the kings of the earth. She commits adultery with the kings of the earth. This means that this is a corrupt church, this is an apostate church which has political relations with the kings of the earth. In other words it's a church that's involved in the affairs of the state. We also notice that this harlot woman sits on many waters. And we've already discovered that the many waters on which the harlot sits represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. In fact we noticed in our study last time that the body of this beast is actually composed of the waters. The waters are the body of this scarlet colored beast. And that's why in one verse we find that the harlot is seated on many waters and in another verse it says that she's seated on a scarlet colored beast. Actually the scarlet colored beast is composed of the waters which are the body of the dragon according to what we studied last time. So she sits upon the multitudes, nations, tongues and peoples and of course the expression sits means that she has dominion over them like kings sit on thrones. She has dominion, she reigns over the multitudes, nations, tongues and peoples and she reigns over the kings of the earth. We noticed also that this harlot woman is called Babylon and she's called the mother of harlots which must mean that if she's the mother of harlots she must have daughters that were born from her. And so this mother of harlots called Babylon has daughters 
and she has illicit relationships with the kings of the earth. In other words there's a threefold union here. There's a harlot, there's the kings, and the daughters of the harlot who are all in harmony, in corrupt harmony. We notice also that upon the heads of this harlot is written a name of blasphemy. And we already studied that blasphemy is when a mere man claims to be God and when a mere man claims to have the power to forgive sins. We also noticed in our study that this harlot is clothed in purple and scarlet. Purple and scarlet are colors of royalty. Jesus was robed in purple and scarlet when the people knelt before him, uh, proclaiming him to, him to be the king of the Jews. So in other words, this is a system that majors in these colors, scarlet and purple. We also notice that this system majors in uh, outward adornment. It says that she's adored with gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. So we're to look for a system that has an abundance of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls in its religious services. We also noticed that this harlot has a cup in her hand. And this cup contains her wine. But we discovered that the wine is composed of her abominations. And her abominations, as we studied last time, represent her false doctrines. We mentioned several of them, like for example the idea that you can speak with the dead, the idea that you're supposed to worship the sun or on the Sunday. It doesn't make any difference which of the two. It's still man establishing for worship that which God has not established for worship. We notice other doctrines like for example the idea that you can eat unclean animals, the idea that you don't have to keep God's law. All of these are spoken of as abominations. So what she has in her cup are her false doctrines which she gives to the kings of the earth and she gives to the waters or to the inhabitants of the world. We notice also that this wine is not uh, taken by the multitudes voluntarily because we're told that this harlot makes all nations drink of the wine of her fornication. We also noticed that this harlot actually drinks the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In other words it's not only wine, it's wine which causes wrath. And we notice that the wrath is caused because when people don't want to drink the wine of this harlot they incur her wrath. In other words, we also notice that this harlot is filled with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. In other words, she is a persecuting power. Now as we look at Christian history, there's no doubt whatsoever which power is being depicted in Revelation 17. In actual fact, not only does the Seventh-day Adventist Church believe that this harlot represents the Roman Catholic papal system, but other non-Adventist expositors such as Dave Hunt who wrote a book called A Woman Rides the Beast has clearly discerned that this harlot woman represents the Roman Catholic system. In other words it represents an apostate Christianity. A system which becomes involved with the kings of the earth. A system which is a church and a state. A system which rules over multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. A system which scripture calls Babylon. A system from whom daughters were born in the 16th century. Daughters that share many of her doctrines. Daughters that want to join today church and state like the mother did in the past. A system that claims to have God's representative on earth. A system which claims to have the power to forgive sins. A system that majors in literally in the colors of purple and scarlet. For those of you who saw the funeral for example of John Paul II. A system whose cathedrals are filled with gold and silver and precious stones and pearls. A system which has its cup filled with doctrines that are not found in scripture. 
which scripture actually calls abominations. Wine which eventually will bring wrath against God's people. There's no doubt that this harlot represents the Roman Catholic system. But there's more in this chapter than just the harlot. One thing which I want us to clearly have in mind in order to understand what we're going to study today is that in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, we have the drying up of waters mentioned three times. Now I want to give you the context so you understand what we're saying. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 15, you notice that this harlot is seated on many waters. The waters are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. And of course the waters want to drown God's people. Now let's notice Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 15. It says there, and the serpent, by the way this serpent has how many heads? Seven heads. And he's called a dragon in verse 9. It says, and the serpent cast out of his what? Out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Do you remember the concept of the dragon that I shared with you last Sabbath? This dragon is actually uh, this dragon actually has seven heads but the seven heads are seven what? Seven mountains. And what do the mountains send? They send their waters. That is seen as the heads spewing out the waters and then the waters go down the side of the mountain and they come into the valley and they form the the river which is the coil of the what? of the serpent or the dragon. And why is this mouth spewing out waters? Because the waters are going to drown or kill the woman. But let me ask you, at the end of the 1260 years were these waters dried up? Yes they were. Notice verse 16. It says, and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So let me ask you, do the waters stop flowing? Yes they do. Must it mean that the head is no longer sending waters to form the body of the dragon? Yes the dragon is dead so to speak. Are you following me or not? Now let me ask you, according to Revelation were the waters going to flow again after they were dried up? Yes, because in Revelation 12, 17 we are told, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. That's after the waters are dried up. And it says, and he meant, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice here three things. Number one, the serpent is spewing water out of his mouth, to try and destroy the woman during the 1260 years. At the end of the 1260 years the earth swallows up the waters, in other words the waters no longer are flooding, they're no longer persecuting. But then we notice that the waters are going to flow again because it says that the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make a final war against her. Do you know that we have the same idea in Revelation chapter 13? Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. Revelation 13 verse 5. Now it's not talking about a dragon beast persecuting the church, it's talking about a beast from the sea who persecutes the church. And notice it says, and there was given unto him, that is unto this beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue how long? 42 months. Is that the same as the 1260 days where the water was being spewed out of the mouth? Absolutely. Now let me ask you, what happened to the head that is, uh, that is dominating at this time? What happens at the end of the 42 months? Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 10. It says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. What was going to happen with this system that persecuted during the 42 months or the 1260 days? It was going to be what? It was going to be wounded, which means that it was no longer going to be able to persecute. 
But let me ask you, is that the end? Or is there going to be a revival of this beast, of this particular head? Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Revelation 13 and verse 3. We're told here, And I saw one of his heads, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was what? His deadly wound was healed, and the whole world wondered after the beast. Do you see the same three stages? In other words, the, the dragon is spewing out waters, persecuting the woman to try and drown the woman. The earth dries up the waters, and then the dragon is, is enraged and goes to persecute. Revelation 13, the beast persecutes the saints for 42 months. At the end of that period, this head receives a deadly wound. But then its deadly wound is what? Is healed, and the whole world wonders after the beast. Now we need to say a few more things about this scarlet beast of Revelation chapter 17. First of all, I would like us to notice that this scarlet colored beast is actually the third of beasts in Revelation that have seven heads and ten horns. In Revelation 12 we have a dragon beast which has seven heads and ten horns. In Revelation 13 we have a beast from the sea that has seven heads and ten horns. And here we have a scarlet colored beast which has seven heads and ten horns. What I'm saying is that these three beasts are closely related. They're describing different periods of dominion of this same power. Now allow me to explain what I mean. The first beast, the one of Revelation 12, actually arises in heaven and he's battling against the man-child who's going to be born. Let me ask you, what stage is that talking about? What was the power that tried to slay Jesus when he was born? That's the Roman Empire, right? Revelation 13 speaks about this beast that rules 42 months or 1260 days. What stage is that? That stage is Papal Rome. Are you following me or not? So you have the dragon, that's Rome, that's the empire of Rome. Then you have in Revelation 13 the beast. That beast represents which Rome? Papal Rome, which at the end of its dominion receives a deadly wound. Now let me ask you, do you just suppose that this beast of Revelation 13 is going to have a resurrection to power? We already read it, right? Now the third beast of Revelation 17, this is where it becomes very interesting, does not arise in heaven, like in Revelation 12, because this is a heavenly battle between Satan and the child who's going to be born. It does not arise in the sea, where there are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. This third seven-headed beast with ten horns rises from the abyss in Revelation 17. Now you say, why is that significant? Allow me to tell you why. In Scripture, the abyss represents the abode of the dead. It's where dead people go. In other words, if this beast is rising from the abyss, it must be rising from what? It must be rising from the dead. Are you understanding me or not? Now the question is, when did it die? It was killed at the end of the 1260 years, or at the end of the 42 months. Are you following me or not? I want you to notice Romans chapter 10 and verse 7 on the abyss, so that you see that the abyss is the realm of the dead. In other words, this beast was alive before, it was wounded, it was cast into the abyss, the abode of the dead, and now it's rising from the dead, because its deadly wound is being healed. It says there in Romans chapter 10 verse 7, speaking about the resurrection of Jesus, it says, Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from where? To bring up Christ again from the dead. So when you go to the deep, what do you do? You raise Jesus from the dead. In other words, the abyss is the place of death. This beast was wounded, and he was killed, and now in Revelation 17 he's coming from the abyss because he's resurrecting to power. Now, I want you to notice also that this dragon beast has seven heads. Now you say, what do the seven heads represent? Well, 
we're told in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 10 that the seven heads represent seven kings. Notice the first part of verse 10, and there are seven kings. So what do the seven heads represent? Seven kings. But in Bible prophecy kings are interchangeable with what? With kingdoms. We noticed this last time. For example in Daniel 7 verse 17, speaking of the four beasts, it says these four beasts are four kings. But they're actually kingdoms. Because in verses 23 and 24 it says that a fourth kingdom will arise. In other words the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom. Kings are equal to kingdoms. In other words these seven heads represent kingdoms. Now you say which kingdoms do they represent? Some people think that they represent Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Papal Rome, and resurrected Papal Rome. I want to tell you that I don't believe that that scenario fits. You say why not? Well first of all because in all of the lines of prophecy of Daniel 7, Revelation 12, 13, and 17 Babylon is the first power that's spoken of. In other words Babylon is always first in the line. Assyria and Egypt never appear. And so I don't believe that Assyria and Egypt actually should be included as heads. The heads must begin with Babylon. Some people have thought that the seven heads represent seven popes that have risen to power since 1929. Because that's supposedly the date when the deadly wound was healed. They say that uh, the five that are fallen, because Revelation chapter 17 verse 10 says five are fallen, one is and the other has not yet come. And so they say the five that are fallen are Pius the, the 11th, Pius the 12th, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul the 1st, and then of course when he was alive they said John Paul the 2nd is the one who is. See five are fallen, John Paul is, John Paul the second is, and the other one is not yet come. And when he comes he'll rule a short time. So in other words they say that Benedict the sixteenth is the one who is to come. You know this is pretty close to setting a date for end time events which were forbidden from doing. Furthermore, why do we choose 1929 as the beginning date for the healing of the deadly wound? Folks the deadly wound was not healed in 1929. I know that we've taught that years and years but it was not healed in 1929. You say how do we know that? For a very simple reason. In 1929 it was Italy that gave power back to the Vatican. But Revelation 13 makes it clear that it will be the United States of America which will return power to the Roman Catholic Papacy. Not Italy. The United States will be instrumental in returning that power, in healing the deadly wound. So how could the deadly wound be healed in 1929 if it was Italy who returned the power to the Vatican, not the United States at that point? Some people say, Pastor Bohr, don't you think that the United States could be one of those heads? I'll tell you I don't believe so because in Revelation whenever the United States appears, it always appears helping the previous beast. In other words the United States plays an auxiliary, auxiliary uh, role in restoring the power to the previous beast. It's not presented merely as a separate power, it always does everything with reference to the beast. It enforces the mark of the beast, it, it commands everybody to worship the image to the beast, it commands everybody to receive the number of the beast. In other words everything is done with reference to the beast. Now you're saying then who are these seven heads? Well allow me first of all to tell you that there are three stages in the end time to this beast. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. Revelation 17 verse 8. Remember the, the body of the beast is what? What is the body of the beast? Come on! Did you catch this point? The body of, be of the beast is composed of the what? the waters. The body of the beast is the waters upon which the harlot is sitting. Very important. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. It says, the beast that thou sawest was. The beast what? Was. Past? Yes. 
and is not. In the present what? Is not. And now notice, and what? And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Or out of the abyss is a better translation. Where is the abyss? The place of the dead, where dead people go. That's where Jesus rose from, from the deep, from the abyss. It's the identical Greek word. So we have three stages. The beast was, is not, and shall arise. Does this sound very similar to a beast that ruled for 1260 years, received a deadly wound, and for a period is not, because the waters are dried up, See, when the, when the head no longer sends water, the body of the dragon is dead. And shall be, because its deadly wound will be what? Will be healed. This is repeated several times in different ways. Notice what the last part of verse 8 says. And they, it says, And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and the King James translates yet is that word is is in italics they think it should say it yet is in the Greek it actually says yet shall be so once again the idea of was is not shall be notice also it's ex how it's expressed in Revelation 17 verse 10 and there are seven kings or kingdoms. Five are fallen. In other words, five heads are what? Five heads are dead. And one is. And the other is what? Not yet come. How many stages there? Three once again. So the past deals with five that are fallen. One is, even though he isn't, according to what we notice. See, this power is, but it isn't. And then it says that the other is not yet come. Notice verse 11. It says, and the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. So basically we have three stages. One past, the beast was. One present, the beast is not. And one future, the beast will be. Five are fallen, one is, although he isn't, and the other one is yet to what? Is yet to arise. This fits perfectly with the earlier chapters in Revelation. Revelation 12 and 13 where you have the dragon spewing out waters, the waters are dried up, which means that the dragon is now what? The dragon is now dead because he's not sending waters to persecute, and yet then the dragon is enraged with the woman and goes to make war against her. It goes perfectly with Revelation 13, this beast that governs 42 months, persecutes the saints of the Most High. At the end of its period, it receives a deadly wound. It, it not, is not, yet it is. Because the system exists, but it is not in the sense that it's not persecuting now. But it says that it will be, because its deadly wound will be what? Its deadly wound will be healed. Now it's of critical importance to realize that these heads govern consecutive, consecutively and not simultaneously. In other words, they rise one by one. Now you're probably wondering, Pastor, what do these seven heads represent? I'll tell you what I have come to the conclusion uh, that these uh, heads represent on the basis of my study. I believe that the first head represents the kingdom of Babylon. I believe the second head represents Medo-Persia. I believe that the third head represents Greece. I believe the fourth head represents Rome. The empire of Rome. Undivided Rome, if you please. Because Rome governs for a while before it's divided. Isn't that right? The fifth head would represent 
divided Rome. In other words, Rome in its divided state. Once the barbarian tribes come from the north and carve up Rome. The sixth head would represent papal Rome. And the seventh head would represent papal Rome restored to power. In other words, papal Rome resurrected. It's very important for us to realize that all of the heads are not ruling at the same time. They rule one by one. The seven kingdoms that the devil has used from the times of Babylon till the very end of time to try and take control over the world. Now you say, how do we know that the heads only rule or govern one by one? And that they are slain one by one? Well the fact is, those of you who get the DVD presentation of this are going to have a very interesting picture of a tablet which was, actually it's a, a cylinder seal, which was uncovered in uh, ancient Mesopotamia where Iraq is today. And it's interesting you have two deities there with spears and they're fighting against this seven-headed dragon. And with their spears they have slain four of the heads of the dragon and those four heads are all drooping. But there are three heads that are still erect and the gods are with their spears and they're fighting against these heads. In other words, they're slaying the heads, how? One by one. Not only do we have the testimony of archaeology, but we also have the testimony of scripture. That dragon beast of Revelation 12 has how many heads? It has seven heads. So how many mouths would you expect it to have? Probably seven too, if it has seven heads. And yet I want you to notice that only one head is spewing water out at a time. Notice Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, and let's read once again verse 15. Remember that this serpent or dragon has seven heads. You would expect all seven heads to be spewing out waters, but that's not the case. It says, and the serpent cast out of his what? Mouth singular water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. How many heads are functioning during the 1260 years? One. Revelation 13 added, adds its testimony. How many heads does the beast of Revelation 13 have? It has seven heads, right? This sea beast has seven heads? Let me ask you, are all of the heads functioning simultaneously or are they functioning one by one? one by one. You say, how do we know that? Because we are told very clearly in Revelation chapter 13 that I saw one of his heads as though it were wounded to death. In other words, the seven heads represent seven consecutive kingdoms upon which apostate religion has tried to take the predominance. Now some people might say, well Pastor Bohr, but why do you have four heads representing Rome? Isn't one head enough to represent Rome? It would be, except for the fact that the Bible doesn't present it that way. Listen to what I'm going to say. There are three beasts, separate beasts representing three stages of Rome. Revelation 12, the dragon beast is Rome, right? The one who wants to kill the child? Revelation 13, this sea beast that governs 42 months or 1260 days, is that also Rome? Yes, but it's a se separate beast. What about the beast of Revelation 17? Is that a separate beast also? Yes, it represents restored Rome. By the way, do you know that these Romes all had to fight the previous Rome to gain the ascendancy? Rome had to fight Greece. The barbarian kingdoms sacked Rome. The little horn fought the ten horns and uprooted three. And the Bible tells us that the end time Rome through the governments of the world will gain the ascendancy over the world through military and economic strength. So in other words even though we have four stages of Rome they are separate Romes represented by separate beasts. And so basically we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, divided Roman Empire, Rome during the 1260 years, and Rome restored to power after its deadly wound is healed. I find it interesting that Ellen G. White caught this in a statement that we find in Testimonies for the Church, volume 7, page 182. She says this, and notice her terminology. 
she says as we approach the last crisis it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist among the Lord's instrumentalities the world is filled with storm and war and variance but now notice this yet under one head one what? one head the papal power what is that head? the papal power the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses interesting that the papacy restored to power would be called one head because it's the harlot in conjunction with this final head that we find on this beast of Revelation 17 by the way I'd like to read a statement also from Signs of the Times June 12, 1893 where Ellen White speaks about the healing of the wound of the papacy, see it's going to rise from the abyss it's going to arise from the realm of the dead because it was wounded to death she says when the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for his people that they might worship him according to the dictates of their own consciences the land over which for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread the land which God has favored by taking making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ when that land shall through its legislators abjure the principles of Protestantism and give countenance to Romish apostasy in tampering with God's law it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed and now notice this terminology Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of the papacy by a national act enforcing the false sabbath, now notice this, they will give life and vigor in order to give life and vigor there has to be no life and vigor they will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome reviving, you can't be revived unless you've been vived reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience then it will be time for God to work in mighty power for the vindication of his truth now what about the ten horns? the ten horns are not distributed among all of the different heads <coughs> did you hear what I said? they're not distributed among all of the ten heads or the seven heads they are all on the same head they were all on head number five or number four in Revelation chapter 12 they were all on the head of head number six in Revelation 13 and they all will be on the head number seven in Revelation chapter 17 in other words all ten horns are on the same head at any given time you say what do the horns represent? well notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 12 Revelation 17 and verse 12 it says and the ten horns which thou sawest are what? are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with whom? one hour with the beast now I want to tell you that I don't believe that these ten kings are literally ten the number ten in scripture represents something total the whole amount like the ten commandments you know it says that in the ten commandments is re revealed the whole duty of man there are other commandments but they're contained in the ten actually these ten horns represent all of the kings of the world you say how do you know that? go back with me to Revelation chapter 16 Revelation 16 and verse 12 it says, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of, out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet now notice this, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth, now don't miss this point, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and where else? 
and of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. So how many kings are we talking about? We're speaking about the kings of the earth and what? And the whole world. And they're gathered for the battle against God Almighty. That battle is Armageddon. By the way Revelation 17 says that these kings will war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them because He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. In other words these ten horns represent the totality of the kings of the world. The whole world will come together. All of the kings will actually tell their multitudes because they'll reign with the beast. The beast is, the, is the, actually the river composed of multitudes, nations, tongues and peoples. The kings are going to tell their multitudes to destroy God's people. That's the reason why this beast is scarlet. Because the waters are filled with what? They're filled with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Notice what we find in uh, chapter 17. Uh, what's going to happen with these kings? Chapter 17 and verse 17. It says, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill His will, and to what? And to agree. All of these kings of the world are going to what? They're going to agree. Notice verse 13. It says, speaking about the kings, These have what? One mind, and shall give their power and strength unto whom? Unto the beast. In other words, the kings are going to control the multitudes of the world to tell them to flood God's people, to destroy God's people. Allow me to read you a statement from Spirit of Prophecy. This is in Selected Messages, volume 3, page 392. Ellen White says this, The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive actions. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience, after the example of the papacy. Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then she says this, every nation will be involved. How many kings are we talking about here? The whole world. All of the kingdoms of the world. She says every nation will be involved. These have one mind. The, there will be a universal bond of union. Notice, a universal bond of union. One great harmony. A confederacy of Satan's forces. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty. Freedom to worship God according to the dictates of the conscience. As was manifested by the papacy. When in past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. In other words, the Roman Catholic system is going to resurrect to power. Aided by the kings of the world and aided by the daughters Protestantism according to this statement. And they're all going to have one mind. And we're told in Revelation 17 and verse 14 that they are going to make war with the Lamb. Now we need to understand what that means, war with the Lamb. You know many people think that when Jesus comes you know they're going to be shooting, they're going to be shooting nuclear weapons at Jesus to prevent His second coming. That's not what it's talking about. The warfare of Satan is carried on against God in the person of His people. Remember, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus said, but He was persecuting the church. In that you have done it unto one of these, the least my brethren, you have done it unto me. When the Egyptians came against Israel, and they followed them into the Red Sea, as Israel was escaping to the other side, who were the Egyptians fighting against? Israel. But suddenly the wheels fall off of their chariots. And the Egyptians say, the Lord fights for Israel. Let's flee. In other words, by fighting against the people of God, they are fighting against the God of the people. So when it says that they will make war with the Lamb, they're not making war directly with the Lamb, they're making war with the Lamb in the person of His what? of His people. And the good news is, we're told there in Revelation 17 verse 14, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. 
for he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings and notice that he's not by himself because it says and they that are with him are called and chosen and what? and faithful now we've talk, talked about one drying up of the river Euphrates when the dragon spewed water out of his mouth 1260 years waters dried up at the end of that period but then the waters flow again because the dragon is enraged with the woman Revelation 13 the beast persecutes God's people for 42 months at the end of that period the beast receives a deadly wound but the deadly wound is healed and now the beast is the head is going to send waters again to try and drown and destroy God's people let me ask you is there any time when those waters of persecution at the end of time that the dragon spews out of his mouth against those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus is there any time that those waters are going to be dried up again? absolutely notice Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12 Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12 it says, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. What does that Euphrates represent? <coughs> what kingdom was seated on the Euphrates? Babylon. Babylon. What is the name of this harlot? Babylon. So what are the waters that she sits on? The Euphrates. Are you with me? And what is that Euphrates? multitudes, nations, tongues, and what? and peoples. Now what's going to happen with those waters that, the, that this last head is, uh, is spewing out to try and destroy God's people, this scarlet beast filled with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, what's going to happen with the waters that support the harlot? It says here in verse 12 that the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was what? dried up. What must that mean? If the waters are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples upon which the harlot sits means that while she sits on them things are going well. While she's sitting on the heads of this beast, of this scarlet beast she's controlling the kings of the world. What must it mean that the waters are going to be dried up? it must mean that at some point the multitudes, nations, tongues and peoples are going to what? they're going to withdraw their support is this exactly what happened in the French Revolution? did the multitudes arise against this system? yes at the end of the 1260 years but at this point it's going to be a global withdrawing of support allow me to read a fantastic statement from the Spirit of Prophecy Great Controversy pages 635 and 36 see Ellen White had this very clear in her mind even though she doesn't quote the verses this is what she's discussing she says with shouts of triumph, jeering and imprecation throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey what is it that rushes? waters rush when lo a dense blackness deeper than the darkness of the night falls upon the earth then a rainbow shining with the glory from the throne of God spans the heavens and seems to encircle each praying company and now notice this this is when the wicked are wanting to destroy God's people at the moment of the sixth plague she says the angry multitudes are suddenly arrested what would that be equivalent to? If the, if the multitudes are about to rush upon God's people but they're arrested it must mean that the waters are what? dried up, that's correct she says the angry multitudes are suddenly arrested their mocking cries die away the objects of their murderous rage are forgotten with fearful forebodings they gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant and long to be shielded from its overpowering brightness a little bit further on in Great Controversy page 656 she amplifies this idea and now she's talking to me she says the people see that they have been deluded in other words the, the multitudes and peoples they've been deluded by, this, by these systems they accuse one another of having led them to destruction but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers you know some people don't like the fact that I'm so 
politically incorrect. Just lay it out like it is. You know, and, and I can understand that. You know, it's not, it's not popular or easy for me to say that the papacy is this, this beast restored to power. But it's the truth. And if I don't tell you, and you're lost, you're going to blame me. Now notice what she continues saying. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in their despair these teachers, which by the way represents the harlot, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. Now listen to this, the multitudes are filled with fury. Remember that the waters that dried up to allow Israel to go by then drowned the Egyptians? the waters that dry up on the harlot are going to arise to drown her. The very multitude she used to persecute God's people now are going to persecute her. The very kings over which she reigned will hate her. We're going to notice in a minute. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. Wow. Their very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. That's why I don't much care whether you say, oh that was a great sermon, you're a great man, Pastor Boer. Immaterial. Because ultimately I want to hear from God, well done thou good and faithful servant. You know what people think? That's nice to hear, well that was a good sermon, I understood, that's nice but I'm really concerned about what God thinks. She says the very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people, see the waters were going to kill God's people, they were going to flood God's people when the last head's wound is healed and it rises as number seven from the abyss it says the swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. Strong words. Now I need to talk to you before we come to an end about the third drying up of the Euphrates. This is I believe the meaning of the eighth. There are not eight heads, there's seven heads but the seventh counts as an eighth. And I believe it's dealing with events that take place after the millennium. Now I'm going to summarize because uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but we need to understand the prophecy in the Bible about Leviathan. Any of you ever heard of Leviathan? There are three main passages in the Old Testament about Leviathan. One is Psalm 74 verses 10 through 14. There we discover that Leviathan was a multi-headed sea creature. That's important. A sea creature with multiple heads. In Job 41 we discover that Leviathan is the king of the children of pride. And in Isaiah 27 and verse 1 we discover that Leviathan is the coiled serpent and the dragon who is in the midst of the seas. In other words, Leviathan is this seven-headed creature of Revelation chapter 17. Now you say, how does this apply after the millennium? Well the fact is folks, that when the waters of the Euphrates are dried up and the wicked kill each other and destroy each other, how much of a power base is the devil going to have? How many, how many multitudes, nations, tongues and peoples, how many waters does the devil have when the Euphrates dries up? None. Because all are going to die. All of the waters are what? Dried up. There's no heads governing in the world anymore. All seven heads have already functioned. But let me ask you, are those waters going to flow again? Not only are the waters going to flow, but every one of these kingdoms that existed previously is going to once again spew water out of the mouth. You say, how's that? 
Well, when Jesus comes, all of the wicked are what? Destroyed. The rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years are finished. It says in Revelation chapter 20. So how many waters does the devil have supporting his cause? None. They're all what? They're all dried up. Because all are dead. Remember the abyss? The abyss is the place of the dead? Well, let me ask you, what happens with all those dead people after the millennium? They are all going to what? Resurrect it. Resurrect. Let me ask you, are the waters going to flow again? Are the multitudes going to surround the city? Is it going to be like the sand of the sea? When the devil has all of his multitudes back. And by the way, the multitudes he has after the millennium are from every kingdom in all of the history of the world. All of the heads will be spewing out waters. And what will be the intention? To try and destroy God's people who are found where? Inside the holy city. So are the waters going to flow again? Yes, on a universal scale. But then something's going to happen. By the way, if you want to read Psalm 46, there you have a description of, of those raging waters outside the city and those who are inside the city of God. It looks like God's people are going to be destroyed. Those outside are many more than those inside. And then God shows that panorama above the city. Listen to what I'm going to say now. Before the millennium, the multitudes turned against the harlot, the system of Babylon. The kings hated the harlot. The beast hated the harlot. Because the multitudes and the kings see that the harlot has deceived them. So the religious systems turn against, the, the political systems, the multitudes turn against the religious system. But who is the real cause behind all of this? Who is the one who has used this religious system to accomplish his purposes? Satan. And so a panorama is seen above the city where the whole history of the human race is shown. All of those outside the city see what Satan is really like. They, for the first time, they discover that they've been deceived by this arch enemy. Up till this point, they've all gathered together to attack the holy city. Because they think that those inside are the enemy. And those outside have the true and right cause. And so now when they're ready to attack the holy city, God shows them things as they really are. And then you have the final drying up of the waters. You know, most Adventists believe that the wicked are destroyed attacking the holy city. That's not what, the, the, that's not what Scripture or the Spirit of Prophecy teach. The wicked will never attack the holy city. Do you know who they're going to attack? Satan. Like they attacked the harlot at the moment of the second coming, the religious system, they will attack and seek to destroy the head behind that system after the millennium. Allow me to read you a statement. Great Controversy, page 671. And Ellen White is getting this from Ezekiel 28, verses 2 through 10. She says, Satan rushes into the midst of his subjects and endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them to instant battle. But of all the countless millions whom he has allured into rebellion, there are none now to acknowledge his supremacy. His power is at an end. Did the power of the system come to an end before the millennium? Is it going to come to an end after? Oh yes. She says the wicked are filled with the same hatred of God that inspires Satan. But they see that their case is hopeless. That they cannot prevail against Jehovah. Their rage is kindled against Satan. And those who have been his agents in deception. And with the fury of demons they turn upon them. This will be the final drying up of the waters.
And then God will destroy sin and sinners. It will take a while. But after they're destroyed, God will make a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. God has pointed out in this chapter, folks, what's awaiting us. It all fits with Revelation 12 and 13. Prophecy all fits together like a glove on a hand. We are living in these days when the wound is almost healed. Let us prepare for the trine events that soon will take place in this world. Father in heaven, we thank you for having been with us in our study this morning. We're dealing with complex things. But we thank you that through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, these things become clear in our minds. Oh, Father, what, is, what a privilege it is for us to know your message. But what an awesome responsibility as well. Because the religious world is oblivious to all of these things. Help us to reach these people. Help us, Lord, to prepare ourselves to study more, to pray more, to witness more, to become more involved in church, to inv invest our resources in your kingdom, Father. We thank you for having been with us and for answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.